case you're confused, don't let Zoom deceive you. My name is not Randy Bolander. I'm, I'm not his mini me. Um, so, but we do have one cool thing in common, and that's that we are both from, or at least have lived part of our lives in North Dakota. So we're representing the beautiful state there. And Steve and I have, have both lived years and years in South Dakota. Um, I know some of you were at the uh, Jason Upton worship time the other night. And, and I wanted just to start by with, with this fun little story that kind of gives a glimpse into our lives. And, and so at that worship time, Jason was sharing about a time years and years ago when they were visiting Randy and Kelsey. And most or all of the Bolander kids were vomiting during their time there. There, there was just stuff going everywhere. And, uh, and Randy had gone into a meeting the next morning at IHOP and this young leader came in and Randy's like, I was up all night, I had kids thrown up all over me. And, and the other guy's like, oh, I know just what you're feeling. I have a dog. And, uh, and it was comical because it's like, yeah, there's no comparison. But it gets a little closer for us because when we were living in China, we were on the 24th floor of an apartment and we bought a puppy. And we tried to house break a little uh, yellow lab living on the 24th floor of an apartment, which most of the time looked like when we thought he was about to go running into the elevator halfway down, because it took two minutes to get down to the bottom, he couldn't hold it anymore. And then we'd go back up, get some paper towels, clean it all up. Um, and, and so there were days where I'm like, it was easier with a kid. You just put a diaper on them. They run around, they do their thing. Every few hours you change them. Um, but that, that was a fun little moment of our lives. Uh, I, I could share a lot more on that, but um, first of all, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm so honored to get to be with all of you, both in terms of just being family together, uh, in terms of sharing my heart. Um, when Randy asked me to speak, he, he mentioned that people would want to hear a little bit of my story. So the, the two things I want to hit this morning, I, I do want to share a little bit about who we are, where we've been, what we're doing. Uh, but then also at the same time, in light of the significant hour that we're living in, I want to share a few things that I feel that the Lord is speaking. Um, for those of you that have been alive for the past few days, I think we all have heard the news of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's passing. And, and so in light of this all, it's like we walked through and are still really in the crux of this global pandemic with COVID. Then we hit this really intense summer season of racial tension and, and violence and unrest and protests. And, and then we come into August, September, and it's like the intensity of the election season is upon us. And now it's just like, you know, and in the midst of it, there's natural stuff, there's the fires in, in, on the West Coast, there's the hurricanes down in Florida. I'm losing these. I must have smaller ears than Randy. Um, and, and then in the midst of this all, one of, if not the most influential, however you want to read into that, Supreme Court justices of our lifetime has passed away. And now we're going to enter into this intense shaking of, is Trump going to get another court nominee put on the court? And, and so in light of that, um, you know, there, there's so many opportunities around us, and there have been for such a long time, to really allow this unrest, this swirl, this stirring of our emotions, this unsettled feeling. And before I jump in this morning, I just want to pray one more time over us. Uh, some of you know that we are on the back end of the first fall festival in the Jewish calendar, which is uh, it's Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah, uh, the, the blasting of the trumpet or the, sh the shouting of the noise. Um, and I want to read this from Nehemiah 8. In Nehemiah 8, it's the story where the people recover the law, and it just so happens that it's on the first day of the seventh month, which is this new year festival for them. And ne Nehemiah 8, um, I'm going to start in verse 9, just read a couple verses. It says, Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. 
Do not mourn or weep, for all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And, and I'm going to come back around to this moment that we're in. But one of the main marks of this holiday was one, that they would feast together, and two, that there would be blastings of the shofar. Just these loud trumpet sounds that was meant to bring them back to that moment when they stood before the Lord and he came down in fire on the mountain and the mountain was shaking and there's lightning and thunder and, and a loud trumpet to remind them that I am the Lord your God that brought you out of bondage, out of slavery, that I've delivered you. But it's also then foreshadowing there's a coming greater exodus, greater deliverance when Jesus returns. And, and the combination of those two, both the remembrance and the foreshadowing, Nehemiah really speaks it out here. He's like, that can be present, current, substantial joy for you. So I just want to release that this morning as we jump in today. Father, we thank you, God, that, that as the Jewish people, and, and many of us are, are remembering this day of trumpets, Lord, we ask that you would trumpet, that you'd blast the sound within our midst, within our own hearts, God, that would say the joy of the Lord is our strength. That as things around us are shaking, we have received of a peace that is not circumstantial, that does not depend upon how things look, feel, sound around us. Lord, I ask that even that, that, that trumpet blast would quiet us on the inside today, that we drink of that joy that is found in the gaze of your eyes. So Lord, draw us in today. Touch us with your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, I'm, I'm very excited just to get to know you guys a little bit more today. I, I know I'm the one sharing, but I feel like just the, the journey of being known and, and opening our heart a little bit to you will, fit, will further connect us as well. Um, I know last week, <clears throat> Randy mentioned just briefly that I, that I had a trip up to Sioux Falls to do some ministry. I appreciate your prayers. I may be a little raw from that this morning. Um, it's a very hard and painful time personally, and, and I'll touch on that a little bit later on. Um, but two years ago, almost to the two years ago in October, almost to the month, our family of six, you can see them, Carla, if you want to wave, my beautiful wife, Carla. On her left is our second daughter, Miriam. On her right, our son, Zadok. And then we have Mariah, our oldest, and JL, our almost three-year-old. There she is. Hi, JL. How's it going, sweetie? Um, the six of us returned from China, where we had lived the previous seven years. We landed in Kansas City, thinking we were coming to do a three-month sabbatical, and that we were going to be launching back overseas. And as, if you're good at math, you know that it's been longer than three months. Um, so the Lord has kept us here and it's been a very significant, very strategic, very formative time for us. But, uh, we met many of you right around that time because we jumped in, uh, at Hillcrest and, and found family with a lot of you and, and with some others. Um, and, and so we've been in Kansas city for about two years. We still are convinced and, and know that we're called to the nations and, uh, potentially this next year we'll be launching out. But in the meantime, we are uh, running with a ministry called Luke 18, which is part of the International House of Prayer, focused on revival on campuses, awakening among a young generation. And for us, it's really kind of brought together <clears throat> this, this drawing of our heart to a young generation with God raising up another student volunteer mission movement. Uh, so we're excited just to kind of see where this goes as we're here in Kansas City. Uh, like I mentioned, I, I grew up in South Dakota, just a, a few hours north of here. And as a teenager, I got really gripped with a heart for the nations. I remember seeing, I went to a Christian and Missionary Alliance church. And so there was always missionaries coming and going. We had a mission board. Um, there was even just these nice little posters that had a, you know, one sentence phrase about missions. 
Uh, and for me personally, my heart was gripped to the point where I recognized God has something significant he's calling me to that's going to impact the uh, unreached peoples of the earth. And then fast forward a little bit to my 20s. I'm giving you the very brief overview. Uh, in my 20s, uh, I was brought on staff at a church in Sioux Falls uh, as an associate pastor. And around that time, just became consumed with, in a very personal way, the prayer of David, Psalm 27, 4, became a man that said, God, this is what I want to define me all the days of my life. Regardless of where I go and what I do, I want to be known as one that reaches out of just depths of love to stand before you and gaze on your beauty, to dwell in your presence. And, um, and for me, as some of you have heard this phrase, it's kind of, it's been around for several decades now, but it's really the buzzword in the prayer movement, mission movement circles called the marriage of prayer and missions. And for me, that really was it burning with this desire of Jesus. I want to be your dwelling place. I want to know you intimately. I want to walk daily hearing your voice. And at the same time, I am so gripped with seeing you known among the, the peoples who have never heard of your name before. Um, and being one that would say yes to go into the ends of the earth to establishing these dwelling places of your presence where people can encounter your beauty, where they can know your power and be set free, uh, and, and where you can see people come together as family. Um, so, so all of that led to, in 2011, my beautiful wife Carla and I, and a then one-year-old Mariah, grabbed our five suitcases and we boarded a plane with one-way tickets to Kunming, China. Um, if you, I, I don't expect any of you to know where Kunming is at, but if you look at a map, it's right a little bit north. It's probably an inch north of the China-Vietnam border, depending how big your map is. If you're in the prayer room at IHOP, it's maybe, you know, six inches. Um, and, and so we moved there with a one-year-old we knew a few people from previous trips, but really we went and just said, Lord, we don't know if we're ever not going to live here. And what we are committed to giving ourselves to this journey of seeing uh, the bride of China really come into who she's called to be. And, and so for seven years from 2011 to 2018, Kunming, China was home to us. Um, and, and just to back up one step, during my time, my six years as an associate pastor at a church here in the States, much of that time doing college and campus ministry, um, Carla and I both individually and then together, we became very connected with the prayer movement. Uh, we would bring groups of students down to IHOP for different conferences, and, and we had daily prayer things happening on the campus. Um, we did, even, even prior to that, had done some stuff with Steve and some college ministry at their church. And, and so going to China, we knew that this is simply a continuation. Because if, if you know anything about missions, it's not once you leave on a plane, you're automatically a new person with all new giftings, a whole new vision, you know, all of this stuff. It's like, no, you're just, you're the same person in a different place. And, and so that's really, we, we grab this vision of, we want to see young people give themselves to the place of community prayer and worship, come together as, as a spiritual family, go deep in discipleship in the word, and then be launched out as messengers that, that are really on fire for Jesus to make him known. Um, and when I think of this, I, I really, it can be summed up as Acts 13, the church in Antioch. I don't know if we got there in our series, Little Rough and Ugly. How far did we get in the book of Acts? Not quite that far. Yeah. Um, so Acts 13, I just want to read this quickly. It says, there were at Antioch in the church that was there, prophets and teachers. And it names them. It says, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. And so that really was what we launched into China to see, to see these communities that they're listening to the prophetic word of the spirit. They're grounded in the scripture by the teaching of the word. And as they're ministering to the Lord, he would just begin dropping assignments, whether it's for a neighbor, a family member, for a community, or even for another nation. 
and, and that, that would really become the expression. Uh, I love how as the bridge, that that's, that's who we are already with, in the early days of us forming, the Lord drops before Steve and Kristen, the, the peoples of Alaska that they're gonna go and impact. Um, and so that was our, our kind of launching into China. Uh, I had done a number of trips there starting in 2003. I have, I was talking to Carla last night. It's like, I have so many stories that I'd love to share, but, um, and if you want to hear more, you know, we'd love to just sit down over coffee and, and share ours and hear yours. We'd love that. But, uh, you know, from those early days, my first trip to China, when I was 20 years old, I didn't know anything though. I thought I knew everything. Um, I did recognize from those early trips that the church of China is very strong in evangelism. Um, and, and my early trips were more kind of focused towards that. We would, me and a few other buddies would go on these week long, two week long trips into the foothills of the Himalayans in Southern China. You know, we'd trek in for days at a time just to get to this village that they'd never seen a foreigner before. They, they really hadn't even met people in the village a few hours down the road. You know, one of them we went into and we're like, have you heard the name Jesus before? And they're like, yeah, my uncle knew this man. And, and I think he lives in the next village over. It's like, okay. Um, fun story though. I remember one of the villages we were going into the night before there had been a, just a torrential downpour. This was in the middle of the summer. It's rainy season. And so the road had, had been a bit washed out. And we came upon this spot that was pretty treacherous. And we were on the side of a hill. And down the hill, this large truck had rolling down the hill you know kind of think like a big u-haul big freight carrying truck and so we go down there to see if the people are okay it had just happened they were still in the cab and so we helped get them out and uh, they had just made a phone call to get another truck to come and carry their cargo and we're like okay can we help you move it they're like yes so we go and begin and this whole truck was full of grapes and, and so some of them had spilled out, you know, we're walking in them, there's grape juice all over. And so we spent the next few hours hauling these boxes and crates of grapes up, back up the hill, back to the road so they could get picked up. And we get done and they, you know, they gave each one of us a big bunch of grapes and we went on our way. Um, but just the uniqueness of the opportunity to, to do all of these things in a way of witnessing to Jesus. Um, so, so I knew that, you know, upwards of 10,000 at one point, 10,000 people coming to Jesus a day in China, just explosive church growth. Um, but, but I also knew that in the midst of this, God was not only after people getting saved and, and even people entering into the church, but he was really positioning both the church and in part through the government of China, he was positioning China to deeply impact the nations of the earth and especially the Muslim world. And so we went to China with this, this word stirring in us that China is going to be a spiritual mother to the nations, that there's going to be the greatest mission movement we've ever seen coming out of China with laborers being launched back toward Jerusalem. If, if you're familiar, the Church of China has a vision called Back to Jerusalem. And so we really went wanting to give all that we could to pour our lives into seeing this happen, into seeing young Chinese equipped, trained, sent out, and, and cared for. Uh, and, and so we did. Our first years of China, uh, our first years in China, uh, while they were full of learning Mandarin. Uh, does anybody here speak Mandarin? Just curious. No. I was thinking about doing my sermon in Mandarin, but I thought, well, nobody would get anything out of that. And I'd probably have all of you shut your Zoom off after a few minutes. But no, we, we gave a lot of time, a lot of energy to the language. And in the midst of it, um, very briefly, because I want to get to some other stuff this morning. Uh, in the midst of it, we partnered with a local Chinese mission school. And this Chinese mission school has about 70 full-time people in a dozen different countries in the Middle East. Uh, and they're all focused on reaching Muslims planting very similar prayer communities, as I shared about. Uh, so we went into this school, we taught weekly Bible classes. Um, my favorite was actually, they invited me to come and do like a, a two-day intensive teaching the Song of Songs. 
uh, which I, I have come to very deeply appreciate that book. I said, ah, you know, I'd really like to, rather than just kind of the fire hydrant approach, I'd like to just do, you know, maybe an hour to two hours a week. It's like, yeah, let's do that. And so we just went verse by verse. It took us six months to get through the book, but it was such a significant time. I probably got the most out of it uh, just in, in preparing for it. Uh, but, but teaching them the word, we did a lot of pastoral ministry, um, a lot of inner healing, sozo ministry. My wife was doing a, a, a ministry session for one of the missionaries they had who had been serving for a few years in Iran. And she came back and she was so discouraged and had walked through so much trauma that in the ministry session, it came out that even though she was still serving there as a missionary, she didn't believe in Jesus anymore. And, and praise God, she got saved again <laughs> during that prayer session. But just, you know, we, we really got drawn to, we want to just shepherd these precious people, you know, beyond just the, the practical training, which was happening, we want to shepherd them. And, and so we gave ourselves in friendship to mentoring, all sorts of things, having students to our home. Um, at the same time, we were connected with a number of other uh, ministries. One of them, this is just another really sweet story that I would love to share more in depth another time. Um, but Iris Ministries, some of you are familiar with Heidi Baker, they had a team in Kunming, and, and their main work was that they had a home for children, orphan children with special needs. Because in China, you know, if, if you caught wind of things in the, in the 90s, early 2000s, 90% of Chinese orphan children were girls because everybody wanted a boy. But now it's 90% of Chinese orphaned kids are ones with special needs because everybody wants that perfect child, regardless of gender. And so this ministry was bringing kids from all over the nation with special needs, loving them, seeing healing happening in their midst. And early into our time there, I think it was about three months in to living in China, um, they had just come back from a trip to another part of the country and they brought back with them this three week old little boy who was several months premature. He weighed about four pounds and we saw him and like everybody else, it's like, our heart just melted and we're like, we love this boy. And uh, long story short, that boy is now our son, Zadok. Uh, we've known him since he was three weeks old. He's, he's been a grands for just over six years now. And, uh, and so really over all of you know, the fruit of salvations and deliverance and training up missionaries, et cetera, like that's the fruit of our life in China is Zadok and our three daughters. Um, Miriam was born in Kunming, JL was born when we were living there and, uh, you know, Mariah being one, like that's home to them. And we love that. We love that God has us, not just me and Carla doing something that our kids tag along with, but really as a family called into this. Um, and, and so in the midst of these trainings and et cetera, we, we gathered with this Iris team and a few others and really began carrying in a significant way, several uh, prayer assignments, one of them being the ending of abortion in China. I, I could talk all day on, on that component of it, but there's estimates that 20 million babies a year are killed in China. Um, and it's been happening for over 30 years. So, I mean, that's two to three times the population of America that's been wiped out there. And, and so we gathered weekly with people that were involved in that in various ways and, and just set our hearts before the Lord testimonies of the next day moms that were considering abortion changed their mind babies were saved and and really the beauty of it was that everybody that was part of that prayer initiative over the years ended up adopting uh, children from china it was it was precious um an another major prayer assignment was the government the, the communist government president xi jinping uh, things like that and, and so one last piece on this um our last three years in china the Lord led us from the, the heart of the city we were in, a city of about 8 million. And we moved to the south part of the city where they had just built this whole new city for college students. Um, most major cities in China are doing this. And so this was a university city. There were 10 campuses, 20 to 30,000 students each. Um, and, and that's really all that was there. I mean, we lived in one of the few apartment complexes and we, on the 24th floor, we could look all around 
and just see, you know, these 10 campuses. Um, and, and we felt like the Lord told us to move there and to start a prayer room. We did that under the cover of an art studio. My wife uh, taught art to Chinese kids. Um, but in the midst of that, we had three to four hours a day of, of corporate prayer and worship happening. And just one little cool story from that time. When we moved there, you know, my heart is like, I can't wait to get on the campuses. These students, I know they're so hungry for Jesus. Uh, I can't wait to get out there and, and share and, and all of that. But moving there, the Lord's like, for, for the first nine months, he just constricted us. He re restrained us from even going to the campuses. And he's like, before you do anything, just sit before me. Before you do anything, lift up my name. And, and, you know, when he said that, we didn't know how long that was going to be, but it ended up being about nine months. And finally, we felt this release of like, okay, now you can go. Now you can start connecting with students and sharing. And my very first time on campus, I was at an English corner helping Chinese that are learning English. And, and uh, the topic that evening somebody had chosen was advice. And the last question I asked everybody was, the, on, the, on the sheet, the last question was, do you need advice for anything in your life and who can you ask? And this, this small little Chinese freshman guy looks at me and he's like, I need some advice and I want to ask you. So can you tell me how to be a follower of Jesus? And so I'm thinking, you know, I purposely went thinking I'm going to refrain from just, uh, you know, like sharing everything right away with, with these students. So I'm thinking this guy's a believer. He knows I'm a believer. He's trying to get me to evangelize to the whole group. And, and I'm kind of holding back. I don't know why, but I just was. And, and so I said, well, let's, let's talk later. And so we talk afterwards. And I was like, do you know Jesus? He's like, not really. I was like, okay, somebody's been talking to you. He's like, no, I've never met any Christians. He's just like, I found a Bible. I picked it up. And I was like, I want to follow this man. And, and so I took a slow approach. I was like, I want to make sure you know what you're getting into. And so I invited him, him to come and join us in the prayer room. And he started coming hours a day. And, and joining in prayer and singing worship, he jumped into an, an internship that I was leading. And that first time he came, I was teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and prophecy in tongues. And before we'd even led him through any type of prayer, he's baptizing the Spirit. He's speaking in tongues, you know, and it's like, okay, there's precedent for this. But it's still, it was just wild seeing how when we set ourselves to minister to God's heart, that he began shifting things in the natural. Um, so, so that was really, you know, seven years of running with the church, running in prayer and worship, and, and seeing students touched with the gospel and, and equipped. Um, and, and so I want to kind of transition on this point and, and tie into just a, a brief word on what I feel God doing. But while we were planting this prayer room in China, the Lord gave Carla a very strong word. You know, it's, it's one of those words where it's like, I didn't hear audibly, but it sure felt like it in my spirit. And he said to her that there was a level of breakthrough in the spirit that he wanted to release that would only come when there was a united voice lifted up. And immediately we knew he said that we cannot be just doing our own little thing, but that what he wanted to do in this region was so much bigger than just us, that it was going to require us reaching out to those around us. There was a few other mission groups, a few local churches, and, and really pursuing unity with these ones, which was something that he marked us with from, from days of doing ministry in Sioux Falls, really uniting across denominational lines, across theological preferences or expression preferences, and, and just pursuing that John 17 oneness with people. And so we leaned into that word and, and it was really a precious time of, you know, the challenge of like, oh, this is hard because they are, are so different than us. And yet God's like, yes, but I love them as much as I love you. Uh, and, and just really getting a new paradigm of what kingdom family can look like. And, and so fast forward, we returned, like I said, two years ago from the U.S. And coming back to the States, Carla had a few dreams She's the prophetic one in our family. Uh, she had these dreams. She didn't want me to say that, but she really is. Uh, she had these two dreams, two nights in a row, the same dream. And in the dream, she it was referring to the season we were in, and she was going to a community college. 
she was preparing in a community college for this test that she had to take. And after both dreams, you know, we're processing and it's like the Lord is saying that he's got us in a season of learning the school of community, of learning what it looks like to be in community. And, and I think really the fruit of these past few years is that we have at least we have further language for what that means and that that means family that these few years for us and i think all of us can testify to this is that god is doing something significant in bringing together a family you know more than just you know generals and troops and and soldiers and and all of this it's like he's bringing together a generational community that's committed in love that reaches beyond racial lines beyond political lines beyond denominational lines um and, and that's what we've really been after this time and and really pursuing and, and this is my heart for us and i know it's randy's and many of our hearts for this community now that we're part of with the bridge but pursuing that acts one and acts two family i mean if, if you stop and just think about the diversity of people in Acts 1, you've got a tax collector, you've got fishermen, you've got a former prostitute, you've got women who have been widowed, you have orphaned children, you have tradesmen, you've got this political revolutionary, you, you've got this, this whole gamut of people that, that not only have to deal with that level of difference, but then you throw on top of it, I mean, think about the conversations that James and John had with Peter. Like, hey, dude, you know, imagine both in those three days before when they're back to fishing and then in the 40 days and then the 10 days, just like, how could you deny Jesus? And, and just these wrestles over who they were, what they had done, where they had been. You know, it was only days before they were battling it out over who's the greatest to now realizing we've got to come together around this wounding that we've received, this wounding of love for Jesus. And this wounding of everyone must know who he is to really give ourselves to one another. And, and that's kind of what I want to land on this morning. Because I believe that without that Acts 1, you know, Acts 1 14, they were of one mind. It says later on, they were of one heart, of one spirit. They were in one place, in one accord. Just this, this intentional depiction of their oneness. Without Acts 1 and without the beginning of Acts 2, we don't get pentecost we don't get the spirit poured out on that upper room company because the spirit was not promised to individuals it was promised to a family it was promised to a community of people that said we will gather despite our differences and even in in light of and we will reach for one another and we'll do the hard work of becoming close-knit and, and the process of what that looks like and that's the place like psalm 133 the, the oil of anointing, the oil of the spirit comes upon brothers, upon sisters that dwell together in unity. And so the ability to witness to the resurrection of Jesus is not found in any one person, but it's found as we become family. And I, I so appreciate, uh, Randy said this a few weeks back, that family is not like this magical pot of gold we find at the end of the rainbow. It, it's not found as much as it is pursued and built it's it's that hundred years of noah you know nail by nail hammer hit by hammer hit building an ark um and, and so our family's been part of that with you guys i know all of us have been in that uh, over this past year and i i think on one level you know we say family and it can kind of be this ethereal thing you know we all have a different grid when we use that word um it can be this ethereal thing that sounds really beautiful and really just kind of airy and elegant but you know we all realize in the nat in the natural family can be very messy and i would even say unless it's messy it's not family and unless we get into mess and and work through issues in a way that feels raw and painful and vulnerable it's it's not the depth of family that god is after because family at the core requires letting people see who we really are. And that's, I mean, honestly, that's one of the biggest challenges that we have right now, where for most of you, I, I said to Randy uh, that it's going to be so strange next week gathering and not just seeing people from the shoulder up. 
and, and his reply was, we should do a, a contest where everybody draws what they imagine the other, you know, the rest of their body to look like, and then we'll compare and see how accurate it is. But, but part of that's like, yeah, like we, we've had so few times together that there, there's an added element, uh, obstacle to overcome in really being known and knowing others. Um, part of family is that it requires that we embrace the potential of who we are in Jesus and we see others that way that we see others not only and not primarily by their faults and, and the issues, but that we see them the way God sees them. And, and if you, you only take one thing today away, take this, that your prayer would be, God, let me see these ones around me the way you see them. Let me feel what you feel about them. Because if we can stay in that attitude, in that posture of our heart, that will guard us from the onslaught of accusation, of offense, of misunderstanding of relational distance that the enemy wants to bring upon us right now. And, and so family, it means the deep unveiling of ourselves and a deep unveiling of anything that could hinder the love that we're called to walk in. And, and I know personally for many of us that this past year has really kind of shaken those foundations, you know, without, without getting into the nitty gritty. Um, I think it's so fresh because it's not even been a year, but for many of us, uh, you know, everything that happened with Hillcrest and, and the process and the pain that that brought, the questions that that brought, you know, in moments like that, the human natural response is to pull back a little bit, to become a little bit more guarded, to trust a little bit less, to, to believe a little bit uh, lower of what this could look like. When in actuality, I'm learning that crisis is a time where God is like, this is an invitation to lean in. Um, last, about a week and a half ago, I got a call from uh, the, the associate pastor at, at our church in Sioux Falls. Um, and him and I have a long history, 20 years, uh, best friends in college, etc. cetera. Uh, we did ministry together for years. And, and he gave me a call and gave me some of the hardest news I've ever received in my life. Uh, because the, the senior pastor was really the, the first and one of the only spiritual fathers I've ever known. Uh, there was times where he was closer to me than my own father, where he was the person who knew me the best and knew everything about me. And I received this call to say that, <clears throat> that some accusations had come forth against him, uh, that, that he confessed to them and he immediately resigned as pastor of the church. And that broke me deeply personally, but I knew as part of this family back in Sioux Falls, like I need to be with the family there. I, I need to be there to sit in the pain with them, to encourage them, to just be there to listen, to process, to pray with them. And I need to be there for Bill, the, the former senior pastor in his pain and his journey. And, and it was a hard few days. I, I, I'm so thankful for your prayers in that time. Um, I, I told Randy I had 11 meetings, none of them easy, all of them hitting different levels of, of confusion, of hurt, of anger. And, uh, but yet I walked away with feeling closer and, and more knit to family than ever before. And, and just really quick, I, I'm almost, I gotta check the clock here, I'm, I'm getting close to being done. But um, one amazing and beautiful story of redemption was that for me and Dave, the associate pastor who's, who's now heading things up, you know, we, we did a life together at such an intimate level for years. And about 10 years ago, that started to shift. And I felt it and I noticed it. And part of it was we were, we were expressing our faith in different ways, et cetera. Um, but he pulled me aside this past Monday and he's like, hey, can we just go for a walk and talk? You know, and I thought he wanted to talk more about the situation and the church and and I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And, and he's like, hey, I want to talk about what happened 10 years ago. And, you know, it really felt like, I haven't experienced this personally, but, but it felt in some ways like two sons that come together because of the death of their father and, and they just connect again. And, and they're able to hash through things that had been unspoken and they're able to commit and, and declare and express their love for one another in a fresh way. And I walked away and, and he did too, saying, if this is the only thing that comes out of this, it's worth it. Like the, the ability for us to say, my heart is for you and, and I repent 
for the things I, I judged about your life and, and I forgive you for the things you said. And, and it was such a beautiful redemption in the midst of pain. And, and I wanna just say for each of us that I'm not prophesying pain and crisis, but I know we've all walked in it. And, and if we're willing to walk in a posture of, of love and humility, that God's gonna bring some amazing stories of redemption out of it. And so I wanna to finish today and share just three bullet points. Um, three things that I feel like God is doing in our midst right now in light of all of this. Um, again, we're, we're in the, the second day of the Jewish holiday of Yom Teruah, which means the, uh, the days of the trumpet blast or the day of shouting. Um, and, and I feel like that's significant, and here's why. Uh, Randy gave a message a few weeks ago on betrayal, the story of David and Doeg, um, and, and then David's response, how he had these positional confessions. If you didn't hear it, go back and listen to it because it's not just one of those one-off, like, I don't know what to preach, so I'm just going to open my Bible and, okay, David and Doeg. But I feel like it's really a, um, a, a litmus word for where we're at as a church. And I don't remember if it was a, a few days before, a few days after, but I had a dream right after that message, right before it. And in the dream, I'm driving this big white Dodge Ram pickup truck on a country road. And I come up to this herd of cattle blocking the road. And, and it's this black, it's all of these black cows. And I'm honking and I'm, you know, just kind of slowly approaching. And most of them move out of the way, but there's this one large black bull that refuses to move. And I'm honking at him and and he, he slowly turns at me and then he runs at my truck and just starts battering my truck with his horns. And I'm, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm just getting frustrated. And so finally I, I floor it, I, I hit the gas and the Ram truck goes up and does a wheelie on its two wheels and it scares the bull off and I keep driving along. And within two days, I don't know if it's the same day, but within a few days of that dream, JL wakes up, our, three, our almost three-year-old daughter wakes up and she's like, daddy, I want to tell you about my dream. You know, and, and she says, I had this dream and there was a black cow and there was a big goat. And I'm like, okay, it's that black bull and it's the ram. She's like, there was a big goat with big horns and big legs. And, and that's all she said. Oh, she said it was a black cow that said roar. And, and I'm processing essentially God giving my three-year-old and myself the same dream. And I woke up from my dream and I heard the phrase, the bulls of Bashan, which is a reference to Psalm 22, a messianic uh, psalm about Jesus. And it's referring to those that were mocking him, that were scorning him, that were accusing him, that had turned against him. Really that, that same spirit that Randy was referring to, that betrayal and that accusation and, and just that relational breaking and division uh, that, that I believe the Lord is highlighting in this hour. Because whenever we see the enemy at work doing something, we know that God is at work to do not only the opposite, but something even, uh, even more precious and rede redemptive because of his kindness, because of his mercy. And, and so with that perspective and, and just thinking it's the year, it's the day of the blasting of the ram's horn, I, I want to say these three things to us that I see God doing. The first thing I feel like he's doing is that he's bringing hidden things to light. He's bringing hidden things to light. And, and I say this in part with what we're walking through personally. You know, we're also walking alongside several other individuals and couples that it's like in very gracious ways, the Lord is exposing things. And, and I want to say this because sometimes we think the, the worst thing that could happen to us is to be exposed. And from God's perspective, he's exposing it because he's so kind and he wants to be merciful. He wants to set us free from it. Just like Hebrews 12. I know we talked about this in the early days of COVID that, you know, this, this, this can be embraced as a season of discipline because he's good and kind to us. His, his small lowercase j judgments are an opportunity for us to wake up and say, God, what are you after? What are you wanting to do? And so just like all across Israel, all across the Jewish world, they're blowing these trumpets and, and they're hearing the sound in their ears. I'm, I'm hearing the Lord blast a trumpet in the spirit. 
and, and he's wanting that sound to kind of like, almost like a defibrillator to kind of shock our hearts to attention, to wake us up to the condition of our hearts. And, and for the Jewish people, these days that they're in, the days of awe up to Yom Kippur, it's a time of deep repentance and deep reflection. It's like, I, I want to do the same thing. I don't think there's ever a wrong time for that, but I think now is a time where we need it more than ever. A day of deep searching of our hearts, a day of inviting the exposing of any sin, and of, of any toleration. Just like it says to the church of Thyatira, Revelation 2, I have this against you that you've tolerated. This, that you've tolerated Jezebel, that sexual immorality, that greed, that reach for power and privilege. It's like, God, I want you to reveal any places in me that I'm not maybe the one initiating it, but I'm tolerating it. I'm tolerating it by what I say, by what I hear, by the news articles I read, by the posture of my heart towards people around me, by what I look at in my computer screen. And, and I think he's also bringing to light relational issues, relational strife. He's allowing these things to come to light. And it's his gift. It's his kindness and goodness. I'm so convinced of that. In the midst of the pain that it causes, the pain of seeing people that are not who you thought they were, or the pain of your own heart coming to light, it's the kindness of God to do this so that he can remove anything that would hinder us, that would hold us back. And so that's the first thing that, I, that I'm seeing. And within that, I, I just want to say, lean into a few, a few biblical prayers. Lean into the prayer of David in Psalm 139. Pray this daily, God, search my heart and know me. Try me and see if there's any wicked thing in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lead in, lean into the prayer of the bride in Song of Songs 2. Catch the little foxes for us while the vineyard is in blossom that would spoil the vine. I, I really want us to pray that, that we would invite that searching of the Lord. And, and the second thing that I see him doing, and, and it ties into this, but is that there is a unique mercy in the body of Christ right now for reconciliation. I, I think there's always the invitation for it, but I, I believe strongly that God is giving us a season of grace to be reconciled to one another where we can deal with offenses. Because if you, really, if you read Matthew 24 and you understand the days that we are approaching, the greatest attack of the enemy is coming in terms of relational strife. It's nation against nation, people against people, family against family. It's, it's coming in terms of how do we handle offense? How do we handle it when people betray us? How do we handle it when they misspeak against us? How do we handle it when they just do things a different way than we want to or like them to be done? Do we allow those things to fester inside of us? And, and do we allow ourselves just to say in, in our Christian way, instead of saying I'm angry, we say I'm a little frustrated. Or instead of saying I'm offended, we say I'm, you know, I'm just processing some things. But those are, those are words that allow us to be okay with relational distance. When God is saying more significant than your expressions of spirituality is your ability to be one in spirit. In Matthew chapter six, I believe it is. Jesus says, if you're praying, if you're bringing your offering before me and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave it there. First be reconciled with your brother and then come and get right and, and offer your, your gift to me. And what he's saying there, he's not saying, prayer and worship don't matter. But I do believe to steal a quote from Lou, Lou says that the, the constitution of our community is more significant to the Lord than the fervency of our prayers and the passion of our worship. And I believe that 100%. That while we want to be a praying people, while we value corporate times of intercession and worship, God is saying, in my house, it is more significant that you are first right in your hearts with one another. That, that you are first right in removing anything that would hinder. Because I cannot be with you unless you are family together. Matthew 18, where two or three of you gather. I love how he says we're two or three. You know, he's kind of like a few, you know, it doesn't matter. Just a few of you. I'm not giving you like this prescription of how many you need, but where a few of you are together and you're in agreement, not only saying amen to one another's prayers, but your heart is in agreement being for one another, 
and pursuing me together, I'm there with you. That's the place of spiritual authority. And, and so we're in a season where he is highlighting the need for reconciliation, which really begins with turning our heart, with, with humbling ourselves. You know, I, I don't think, uh, there, there's not time to go into this whole in-depth thing on how do we do reconciliation. Um, I, I think it's worth it, you know, and, and so reach out to others, to Randy and Kelsey, Steve and Kristen, you know, Carla and I have, have a few thoughts on it, but, but I think that the initial thing is that we say, God, I am sorry. We look at the cross, we see Jesus's willingness to be exposed, to be vulnerable, to risk being rejected. And we say, I want to be like that. I want to, I want to go low in humility. I want to own my part in this. I want to open my heart and I want to reach for the other person and affirm my desire for them and affirm who they are in Jesus. If, if we can be people that do that well, that's going to give us such strength to stand in days where offense is raging. It already is. I think we're leaning into a season these next few months where, man, if, if you're reading any news, talking to anybody on social media at all, there's going to be opportunity for division and offense. And, and so for us as a community to say, God, we are committing to pursuing, not only being okay with, but pursuing intentionally reconciliation. And, and I want to be very vulnerable and, and, and very forthright and say that all of us, I would, I would be willing to bet all of us have at least one person that we need to be reconciled with. That doesn't mean the relationship is going to be anything more than it's been or, or whatnot, but it means that our heart's going to get right with that person and with the Lord. And I want to take one more step and say many of us probably have people from whether it was Hillcrest or another church that we've come out of that have people there we need to reconcile with, that we need to go before and say, you know what, I love you. That process was messy and I'm so sorry for my part in it, but I love you. I believe in who you are in the Lord and my heart is for you. And if you never see them again, it's okay. But that, that willingness to reach for one another and reconciliation is so significant for the days ahead. The last thing that I want to say, and then I just want to pray as we wrap up, is that the Lord is giving us an invitation to vulnerability in a whole new way. I know we're all at different stages in our journey with Jesus. We're all at different places in life. We've got all generations here. Um, but regardless of that, our journey towards family looks like I'm going to be known. I'm, I'm willing to be known. I'm willing to confess my struggles with somebody. I'm, I'm willing to repent for things I've said and things I've done. Some of you, it starts with the person sitting on the couch next to you or with your children. Um, I'm, I'm willing to walk through this journey of forgiveness. And, and this is hard. I, I know I'm saying this quickly and it's like, okay, just go do it. But this is painful because it's the deep issues of our heart. And, and some of us have listened to a voice of shame that says, if you open yourself up to being known, you will be found to be not enough, or you will found to be an imposter. And, and I just want to speak over you, Zechariah 3, when Jeremiah is standing there before, or Joshua is standing there before the Lord in filthy garments, this, and the, the enemy is standing there accusing him. And the Lord says, I rebuke you, Satan. I rebuke you, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem, the Lord who has chosen the bridge, the Lord who has chosen your family. This is a brand plucked from the fire. And, and so I want to invite us that part of us coming out of those places of feeling less than, of feeling insignificant, of the voice of shame, it's going to happen as we share our struggles, as we share our battles, our areas of weakness with each other. And, and then as we look at the person across from us and we say, I am for you. I love you. I receive you. I'm with you in this journey of being more and more like Jesus. And, and so I want to leave you with a few more questions here. One of them is, and, and really dig this in. I think Carla is going to type these up for all of us as I share them. Uh, the first one would be, what, where is God inviting you to grow personally? And how can you invite someone else into that? I mean, the significance of going and growing in a journey with someone in terms of finding family together is so huge. So where is God inviting you to grow and how can you invite someone into that? 
another question hitting on that issue of the exposing of hidden things. What issue of sin or compromise is God putting his finger on in your life? For some of us, it's, it's how we relate to our kids or how we talk to our spouse, how we spend our finances, what we look at on our screen when no one's watching. What is God putting his finger on and who can you share that with? That's a, that's a scary one to have on a Sunday morning. Um, and then the third one, what relationship have you allowed distance in that God would want to bring reconciliation in in this season? And, and I'm jealous for that for all of us because I've experienced several times this past week the gift and the freedom of heart that comes by just talking things out with another person and saying, I was wrong. I, I, I thought of you wrong. I looked at you wrong. I spoke of you wrong. I'm sorry. Forgive me. To, to, to have that lifted off of our hearts is so huge. And, and really my heart in all of these things, the exposure of sin, the mercy for reconciliation, the invitation of vulnerability, is that I firmly believe that the bridge, even the name, the bridge, that we are called to be a reconciling community, a community that at the core is known as people that bring two together into one, that walk out this family oneness, both in just the, the daily grind of life, in the place of pursuing Jesus, in partnership and mission with him, that while we've been brought out of pain and crisis, that we would walk in deep and healing relationships. And, and again, though these days are marked with, I, I know you from the shoulder up, that beyond that, that we would answer that invitation to oneness and say yes to Jesus and yes to one another. A oneness that, that would not only enrich our personal lives, that would not only bless the community of Kansas City, but I believe that would really touch and shake things up in the nations to see God's family brought forth. And, and so I'd love to finish and just pray this word over us this morning as we finish. Father, you call us in 1 Peter 4 a to keep fervent in our love for one another. And that love covers a multitude of sins. And so I ask, Lord, for all of us today, Lord, that we would enter the grace of this hour as the nation is shaking and even raging in some ways. Lord, as fear and anxiety are exponentially growing among us, God, that we would walk in the confidence and peace of what you're doing and that we'd walk in the joy of finding one another as family, of reaching through being known reaching through, opening our hearts, Lord, even opening our homes and, and having meals together and engaging with one another in a very personal way. Lord, I ask for each person here, God, that you would show us those places that you want to bring light to, that you want to refine so that we can stand with our lamps lit, burning until the day of your return. Lord, I ask for each one of us that you'd show us those relationships, God, that, that at one point in time meant so much to us and so much to you, where distance has come in, where misunderstanding or offense has been allowed to divide, God, and that you give us grace, God, to reach in humility, to see healing. Lord, I ask that we be marked by this. Lord, as the enemy seeks to plant a fence as a stronghold in so many families, so many communities, and so many nations, Lord, that we would be ones who are not offended with each other and not offended with you. Lord, guard our hearts. Bring us into light, Lord. Father, I thank you for each person gathered this morning. Lord, I ask that your spirit would rest with a, with a unique grace to lean into what you're speaking, that we would hear that blasting of the trumpet from on high that would call us, God, into this awakening in this hour. Lord, we say yes. Lord, we say yes to being a bridge. We say yes, God, to one another, and yes to that prayer of your son. Father, make them one as you and I are one. We ask you to do it in our midst, God, in Jesus' name.